Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this can be a busy time for many, but also a time of remembrance, a time of reflection. And I just pray that, um, that your Holy Spirit would be here, that you would take your words and translate them to our hearts, that we would be moved and touched and changed. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it is the most ordinary things in life that are really the most miraculous. Today I want to talk with you about the miracle of language and the miracle of words. It's not something we think about, it's something we use all the time. Our day is filled with words, hearing and listening and reading and speaking. But have you ever thought about how miraculous words really are? And just think about it. I have an idea, an image a thought in my mind, and I speak some strange sounds out of my mouth, and that idea, that thought, that image is transmitted into your brain. I've got a picture in my mind right now. Probably a picture you have never had in your mind before, and I'm going to make some sounds, and that picture is just going to appear in your brain. You ready? A camel running in yellow slippers. <laughs> Boom! It's there! It's miraculous. Because words not only uh, transmit pictures, but complex ideas, quantum mechanics, profound thoughts like love, faith, and courage. And sometimes in life, it's not until we lose something that we realize how wonderful it is. So I want to just do a little exercise with you this morning. I, I want you to imagine with me for a minute that your life contains no words. That you suddenly lose your ability to speak words to read them, to hear them, to understand them. Imagine with me what that would be like. To help us do this a little bit, I brought some apparatus. You didn't bring yours, I, I don't suppose. But I want you just to take your fingers and put them in your ears. All right. Now, you shouldn't be able to hear me, but you probably still can. So I want you to close your eyes. I did this in the wrong order. So your eyes are shut, your fingers in your ears, and I want you just to imagine that that inky, silent blackness is all that there was. That that was your entire world. Okay. Just think. If moment after moment, day after day, month after month, year after year, your life contained no words. Words are a bit of a bridge between the chasm that separates us as individuals and people. Words are what bring us together. That world that you were just in a moment ago, that silent, dark world, 
was the same world that Helen Keller lived almost her entire life in. Born in in a a southern family in Alabama, well off, 1880, at the age of 19 months, Helen Keller had an illness that the doctors could only describe as um, an acute congestion of the stomach and the brain. Today, we would probably call it scarlet fever, possibly meningitis. But this illness left this young girl completely blind and completely deaf. Just stop for a moment and place yourself in her world. No images, no words, no sounds, just that silent, inky darkness. Helen lived in this world of darkness not because there wasn't light, but because she couldn't perceive the light around her. Not because her parents didn't speak to her, but because she couldn't understand what was being said. It was a world of uh, frustration and anger and confusion. In that world without words, she couldn't even think clearly. She didn't even have words to structure her thoughts. She describes it later in her biography this way. Have you ever been at sea in a dense fog when it seemed as if a tangible darkness shut you in and the great ship, tense and anxious, groped her way toward the shore with a plummet and sounding line and you waited with beating heart for something to happen? I was like that ship before my education began, only I was without compass or sounding line and had no way of knowing how near the harbor was. Light, give me light! was the wordless cry of my soul. The Bible describes the time period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That that gap of 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, the Bible describes it as a time period of darkness. The people who lived at that time were said to be the people who walked in darkness. Now, it's not that God wasn't still light. But how do you, after all, how do you come to know a God who is invisible? How how do you understand a God who is silent? Now, many other cultures, in many other generations, they all had their answers. For most, it was simply, you can't worship a God who is invisible, so you make an image. But for God's people, that wasn't acceptable. God had made known that these images, these crude things fashioned of stone and wood and metal, were insults to the reality of who He was. Others told stories and legends and myths. And God did speak down through the ages, through creation, through His prophets, through the Holy Spirit. And yet, He was still a mystery. People didn't listen. They didn't understand. Maybe they couldn't understand. And it was like by the time of Malachi, God said, that's it. I've said all I could say. And now it's time to be quiet. The book of Amos calls this time period a time when there was a famine. Not for bread or water, but a famine for hearing the words of God. So how do you know when you can't hear? How do you understand when you can't see? For Helen Keller, that deliverance came in the form of a person.
On March 5th, 1887, Anne Sullivan arrived at the Keller's house and entered Helen's dark world. A day that Keller would forever remember as my soul's birthday. My soul's birthday. Anne Sullivan herself had been an orphan, raised in terrible circumstances in the state poorhouse, had lost everyone that she loved, all her family. And because of lack of treatment as a young girl, she herself was almost totally blind. That day that she arrived didn't seem like a birthday celebration, though. Anne's mission was to give Helen the gift of language, the gift of words. This is a film version of an earlier um, play about Anne Sullivan and Helen Keller. And I want you just to, to pay attention to, to, to the mission and the purpose of Anne here in this scene. One word, and it would give you everything. And so for those first weeks, Anne desperately tried to give Helen that gift of a single word. And it was tempestuous. It was difficult. Anne was, uh, uh, found it so hard because Helen was full of anger and, and confusion and frustration. She would fight, and for tantrums, she knocked out one of Anne's teeth. It was difficult. But finally, after weeks and weeks of perseverance and patience and kindness, the gift of a single word came. That one word was the dawning of Helen Keller's soul and her life. She describes it in her own words. She says, as the cool stream gushed over one hand, she spelled into the other the word water, first slowly, then rapidly. I stood still, my whole attention fixed upon the motions of her fingers. Suddenly I felt a misty consciousness, as of something forgotten, a thrill of returning thought, and somehow the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew then that W-A-T-E-R meant that wonderful, cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, and set it free. 
There were barriers still, it is true, but barriers that could in time be swept away. You and I probably don't even know what our first word was. Something we've just taken for granted and, and hardly even thought about. But for Helen Keller, that was a memory, that was the moment in her life that she would never forget. Because that word opened up other words. Suddenly, uh, people had names. Mother and father. She, she could later learn words like love and hope and Christ and salvation. It unlocked a whole world to her. Anne and Helen would go on living together, working together for years. Their relationship transfer, transformed from that of teacher and student to, to governess and governed, and finally to friend and companion. Helen became the first deaf-blind person to complete a bachelor's degree from Radcliffe University. She learned Braille, and with a Braille typewriter wrote over 12 books. She became widely recognized as a public lecturer, a devout Christian, and a social activist. And it all began with a word. The Gospel of John is unique among the Gospels. In that when it is beginning there in chapter 1, and it's starting to tell, proclaim who Christ is, it doesn't start with this story of His birth with shepherds and angels and mangers and midnight departures. Rather, it starts by telling us that Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Just think about this. Think about your life without words. Think about the loneliness and isolation and darkness that there would be without words. And here, John is saying, that Jesus Christ, He is God, but He is also that bridge between God and man, just as words are our bridge from one person to another. He was what makes God's thoughts, His character, His will, His very person understandable and relatable. Just as words are the expression of ideas, so Jesus is the expression of the mind, will, and character of God. Ellen White puts it in Desire of Ages, God's thoughts made audible. What God had to say was not only or mainly what Jesus Himself said, but who Jesus was. He Himself was that word. John makes clear that Jesus was, was God in the beginning. This, this Word, this manifestment of Jesus is, is not some new uh, uh, thing. It's not some change on God's part. But the God who was trying to communicate to His people in the Old Testament has fully and, and finally done it through Jesus Christ. That same God that in the past was murky because of, 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 of the understanding of men and, and the sinfulness of men. The same God who had to be seen through sacrifice and, and, and prophets was here in the person of Jesus Christ. This was the living Word of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt tabernacled among us and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. And here's the difference. How Jesus is even greater than a word. 
When you and I use words, we have assigned meaning to really random sounds. What you and I understand to be elephant could just as easily be camel. It's only the value given to it or added to it that makes those words, that agreed upon value, that makes those words have meaning. But here, Jesus Christ is not just a message, not just a messenger. But He Himself is the message. He Himself is God in the flesh. That Word speaking into our darkness. Helen Keller always spoke afterwards of her two lives. Her life before that day that she understood the Word for water. And her life after. And those two lives to her were as distinct as black and white. The difference was clear. For some of us living on this side of the New Testament, it's hard for us to remember, to think, to conceive what it was like before knowing Christ. Maybe we have always known Him. Just as we've always, as long as we can remember, known words. But that doesn't mean it's not miraculous. Miracle of miracles. John says this, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared him. Jesus Christ is the mind of God who became a person. I want to close with you. John 14. If you'll turn with me there. John 14, 6 through 8. Philip was living in between those two worlds. The world of inky blackness and silence and the dawning of understanding. John 14, 6 through 8. When you get there, you can say amen. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except Through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. It is sufficient for us. Jesus, verse 9, said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me. Me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Down through the ages, the cry has always been, what is God like? Who is He? What's He about? Jesus Christ came to declare what God is, but not just to declare in some sort of informational sort of way, like we can download a database from God and and put it on our hard drive and check it off our list and say we have a, a theoretical understanding of who He is. But He said, if you know Me, then you know the Father. He's talking about a relationship, a connection just as Helen was able to have with her parents, that we can have with Jesus Christ. And in that connection is light and life and truth. So the question for me, for each of us, is how well do I know Jesus? 
Not just how much do I know about Him, but how well do I actually know Him? And how much do I want to know Him? In this, this time between uh, when we celebrate the birth of Christ and the coming of New Year, I think the best thing that each of us could think about as we think about 2019 is at the end of 2019, where do I want to be with God? Do I want to know God the same as I know Him now? Or do I want to know Him fully, abundantly? Jesus Christ is the Word of God made flesh. That bridge from God's thoughts and His heart, His heart to ours. But words can easily fall on deaf ears. Will we take time to listen, to hear, to know? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it is hard for us to conceive of how amazing Jesus Christ is. It's hard for us to conceive of a world uh, without Him, of, of the difference that He has made, of the light and, and truth and understanding that He has brought to us of who You are. May we not take that for granted. May it not seem to us just ordinary and common, but we, may we revel in the miracle of Jesus, in knowing Him, in knowing you. May this be our experience and our reality in this new year. In Jesus' name, amen.